Good morning and welcome to Home of the World's Worst Weather Live. My name is Ian Bailey. I'm a meteorologist and education specialist and I'm part of a crew of six observers who work here at the top of Mount Washington taking hourly weather observations, putting out forecast products, and doing research from the top of New England. And thank you for joining me on this Monday session. Happy Easter to everybody who celebrated it yesterday. Today is a deep dive session where we're going to be talking about wind, but before we get into that, I want to show you a little bit about what's going on with some of our current summit conditions so you guys can see what's happening up here currently because interestingly enough, it is a pretty windy day up here. Uh, so we're seeing winds around 54 miles per hour. Uh, we have seen a maximum 24 hour gust of 91 miles per hour so far. And in the last 10 minutes alone, we saw 76 miles per hour. And that is only likely to go up as we do have a low pressure system moving and we might see winds upwards of 130 miles per hour by the end of the day. Our temperatures have been pretty warm too. So we've been above freezing pretty much since I got up this morning. We're hanging out around 35 degrees and we are seeing precipitation in the form of rain. Now over the weekend we did get about 21 inches of snow with the previous low pressure but now that we're seeing this rain there is a considerable amount of melting of all the snow and ice here across the summit so it'll be interesting to see how much is left by the time this rainstorm is over. Our visibility is super poor we can only really see about 1 16th of a mile currently and a little less than that maybe even out to about 75 feet across the observation deck so visibility is super poor with this thick warm fog that's sitting on top of us currently. And then we're taking a look at our temperature profile here. This is the Mount Washington Auto Road temperature profile from our mesonet. It's a series of weather stations that go from the summit all the way back down to the base, measuring things like temperature and wind. And as you can see, pretty much the entire mountain's above freezing. Up here, we've been kind of dancing around the freezing line here at the summit for the last few hours. But as you go back down towards the base, as we would expect, things are getting progressively warmer um, all the way down to 45 degrees at the base. And so they are expecting some rain conditions as well. Uh, also some snow melt as we do have this really interesting low pressure system moving through. It's going to be a really interesting event over the next few hours or so as we watch. Again, this is a really big system that's moving through. Uh, I want to show you guys real quick an image of Gray, Maine. Um, so you can see what's going on here. Uh, they are the closest National Weather Service point to where we are. We reference them a lot and have a partnership where we share our data with them. And as you can see, they're putting out a lot of watches and warnings. We've got high wind warnings, we've got storm warnings, we've got gale warnings, all of that kind of stuff going on. Um, so this is looking to be a pretty impressive system as it moves through. And again, we might see winds around 130 miles per hour by the end of the day. So it's super appropriate that today's deep dive is talking about wind. So let's go ahead and dive into that. And if you guys are following along with the worksheet, now would be a really good time to pull that out so we can talk about wind. Uh, and if you have any questions, make sure you guys post them in chat. We will have a Q&A session at the end where I'll try to answer as many as I can. Uh, but make sure you pull out that worksheet and follow along. And let's go ahead and dive in and talk about wind. So, first and foremost, what is wind? So wind is the movement of air from one location to another. It's actually really that simple. There's not much to it. Uh, and it happens as a result of the uneven, uneven heating of the surface of the earth from the sun. So there are places on the earth that get a lot more energy, a lot more sunlight and get hotter versus other places. Maybe there's cloud cover or it's a different type of land that don't receive or don't take in as much sunlight. And so it's a little bit cooler. This creates a disturbance in the atmosphere and the atmosphere very much likes to be in a state of balance. So once this happens, a couple of things start to occur. So let me annotate here a little bit so you guys can see. Now in the regions where things are hotter, where they're getting a lot more sunlight, there's a lot more energy, the air starts to heat up and rise away from the surface. Now as it does, as more and more air rises away from the surface, it kind of creates a vacuum right there. And so that vacuum actually becomes a low pressure system. Now what happens is the air rises through the atmosphere and spreads out along the top and eventually it's going to start to cool. Now in this region, in this example where we have clouds, there is a cool region that allows air to sink from aloft. And so what will happen then is air will start to sink down from above. And as it goes to the surface, more and more air will actually start to accumulate down at surface level. And that will create an area of high pressure. Now this in itself is out of balance. And so what happens is the air in this region wants to move somewhere where there's less air. And so air will move from high pressure to low pressure systems. And this movement of the air is what we call wind. And so it's kind of fascinating that wind is one of those mechanisms at play that is helping the atmosphere try to achieve a state of balance by moving from areas where there's too much air to areas where there's not enough. And so that is how we observe and how we define wind. So what different types of tools did we use? And when we actually look at wind, there are two parameters that we are trying to pay attention to. We pay attention to both wind direction and wind speed. Now for wind direction, we use instruments known as wind vanes, kind of like what this one looks like here. It's usually an arrow that points into the direction where the wind is coming from. And for wind speed, we use instruments called anemometers. So they come in all different shapes and sizes and forms with different tools that measure how fast the air is moving across that particular point. 
Now we need to pay attention to these for two important reasons. In regards to wind direction, it's telling us where wind is coming from, where the air is coming from, and it also lets us know what to expect. Let's say, for example, you have a thunderstorm sitting off to the southwest, and all of a sudden you notice your winds are blowing from the southwest, you might expect that storm system to move towards your neck of the woods. You might start to see rain showers and maybe a thunderstorm, and you can know that just by telling what direction the wind is moving towards you. Now for speed, that's relatively obvious. If you're looking at things, especially for high wind events like tornadoes and hurricanes or things that we experience here on the summit, we need to know how fast the air is moving because if it's moving fast enough, it can actually be incredibly damaging. And so these are two very important parameters that we pay attention to. And as you might know, Mount Washington is pretty well known for some pretty crazy wind speeds up here. So far, we've shown you guys a video of 100 mile per hour winds with observers playing on the deck. We've shown you 120 mile per hour winds with the process of de-icing. And for today, I want to show you a video so you can see what 171 mile per hour wind is looking like. So let's go ahead and check that video out here. pretty intense conditions there. And it kind of begs the question, what makes Mount Washington so unique? Why do we see the crazy weather we do versus any other mountain across the region? So I want to talk a little bit about that so you can understand why we do see these really crazy winds throughout the year. So first and foremost, we're going to talk about what we call our prominence. So when you look at it, for hundreds of miles really in any direction, there's nothing nearly as tall as Mount Washington to kind of buffer and slow the winds down. So there's this whole huge region, and really regardless of what direction you look at, uh, the winds are coming at us at full force. So there's nothing, there's no tall mountains, there's no cities, there's nothing really blocking us from getting hit by the full brunt of the wind when they do finally make it up here to our neck of the woods. So we're getting smacked by the full force of the wind regardless of what direction it's coming from. So then we did a 30 year analysis to look and see how different pressure systems and air masses move across the country. And so what I want to do is highlight Mount Washington here so you can see it in the sea of red. Uh, but these red arrows are different storm traps from pressure systems as they've moved from the west coast over here to the east coast. And if you're looking closely, pretty much every red arrow either comes directly over or within the general vicinity of Mount Washington. We're affectionately known as the tailpipe of most of the United States weather because pretty much everything hits us. And predominantly, it's coming from the northwest, the west, and the southwest. We call those our prevailing winds, especially with northwest and west winds, because those are the wind directions that we see more often than not, and that's where most of our pressure systems are moving into the region from. So we see pretty much every type of weather that makes its way across the country affects Mount Washington in one way or another. So then the last thing here is what we call Bernoulli's principle, and that's the idea of taking a fluid and squeezing it through a smaller channel, and that squeezing forces an acceleration in the wind. It's kind of like if you ever stuck your thumb over the end of a garden hose and the water shoots out faster and further. It is the exact same principle here. So you're taking a fluid and squeezing it and forcing it to move faster. Now in this image here, we have the surface level, we have the top of a mountain here, and then we have what's called the tropopause. And the tropopause is essentially the lid of our lower atmosphere. All of the weather that we experience as humans happens underneath it. And it's a very stable layer of air, so not a whole lot can really move above or beyond it. So what happens is as the air moves up and over the summit, it's squeezed between the top of the mountain and the tropopause, and that squeezing forces an acceleration in the wind. Now, what makes Mount Washington so special is beyond that, we have some really interesting topography. So this is actually an aerial view of Mount Washington, and you can see its structure of the mountain range from this point. A couple of things I want to point out here north in this case is actually pointing this way. So that's to the north. And then you can see we have the northern presidential range here. We have the southern presidential range here. And this is where the observatory is right here. Now, if you remember back to the storm track maps I showed you a moment ago, most of everything is coming in from the northwest and the west. Now, what happens then is it comes into the mountain range. It's actually squeezed in the horizontal even before the air starts making its way up and over the summit. So you get this initial squeezing effect down below. As the air moves up and over the summit, it's squeezed between the top of the mountain and the tropopause. Now you get a secondary squeezing, a secondary acceleration that allows us to see winds on average over 100 miles per hour every three to four days during the winter time. So it really has a lot to do with our topography, where things are moving from, and our prominence uh, is why Mount Washington sees the really crazy wind speeds that we do and why we've seen some really impressive events throughout our history. And speaking of which, uh, we are celebrating big wind. Actually, it was yesterday, right along with Easter. Um, that was the date back in 1934 
where we saw 231 mile per hour winds. And for reference, who was there, there were five men, there were five observers who were up here at the time, and eight cats who were on here at the summit to witness what's essentially like an EF5 tornado here on the summit. So if you can try to imagine being on top of a mountain in this building right here, which let me go ahead and zoom back in so you can see, uh, the building is basically a log cabin with shingle roofing inside and heavy metal chains that anchor it to the summit. But if you can try to imagine being on top of a mountain in that log cabin inside of an EF5 tornado, it was a really incredible experience. And we do have the records and accounts for that where the observers up here weren't sure if people were ever going to believe it. They actually had to go through and each of them had to verify that wind speed. And they had different observatories over the radio, like Blue Hill Observatory, listening into the same thing that they were recording to verify that win. And so it held as the world record all the way till 1996. And it's just impressive that not only did everybody survive that event, but they were able to get that instrument off the summit and verify that wind speed. So we are known for seeing some pretty impressive wind. Now this was the instrument that was used to measure that. Uh, that anemometer was the one that measured the 231 note as our heated number two. The technology has actually advanced pretty significantly as you might imagine from that point. So let's talk about some of the different instruments that you might see both at surface level and up here at the summit in regards to measuring wind. So the one on the left here is a pretty typical wind vane. Again, it has a tail on the back that points the arrow into the direction where the wind is coming from. And then you have these directional markers a little bit further down. So whatever arrow, whatever directional marker lines up with where the arrow is pointing, that tells you what direction the wind is coming from. You can see these in all different shapes and sizes. People like to customize them and usually put them on top of their house or somewhere high up so they know where to expect things to be moving from. You might also see different types of anemometers like this one. Some of them might have vanes on the back to help them point them into the wind. But in this case, with this RM Young propeller anemometer, it has a propeller on the front that spins faster and faster as the air blows on it. And you'll see it all of these all over the place at base, uh, surface based weather stations and uh, Department of Transportation weather stations. Uh, but we actually have one up here as well. We use it to measure low wind speeds because this anemometer can actually measure less than one mile per hour, which doesn't happen a whole lot up here, but when it does, it's nice to have this guy as a backup. And then there's also a few other types here. You might have witnessed one of these before. This is a three cup anemometer, and I actually have one up here on the summit so I can show you what that one looks like. And so with this one, there are three cups here and it usually sits on a post and the wind will blow on these cups and cause them to spin. And the faster and faster the cups spin, the faster and harder the air is blowing out, the faster the wind speed is. And so you'll see these all over the place at surface base stations. They're very common. Uh, you'll see them on weather stations and in like airports and things like that. Uh, but you will also see some of these. These are pretty high tech anemometers. These are ultrasonic anemometers and they actually measure wind in a pretty unique way. There is no moving parts with this guy. So there's no vein to point into the direction of the wind. There's no cups or no propellers. What this does, it actually sends an ultrasonic air pulse between these two little sticks, these two little nodes. And as that pulse travels through the air, the wind speed and direction will alter its path as it moves. And the way that that path is altered in fractions of a second is picked up by the instrument and then used to calculate a wind direction and speed. So it's pretty fascinating from rotational anemometers back in 1934 to 2020 where we have these ultrasonic anemometers with no moving parts that are measuring things in fractions of a second. Lots of really impressive ways that we can measure wind, especially at surface base stations. Now up here, we make use of a few different pieces of technology. Uh, so we have a wind vane, so it sits on top of the tower right there. Again, that's to help us tell what direction the wind is blowing from. But we also have this really important instrument here, which is probably the most important instrument on the summit. This is our pedostatic anemometer, and this is how we measure wind on the summit. I actually have an example here, so you can see this is the tube from one of the older ones. And you might recognize this technology because they have them on the front of airplanes. They use them to measure how fast the aircraft is moving through the air. Back in 1940, we took that technology and modified it for our purposes, built one of our own, and it's used to measure our crazy wind speeds. Now, the way it works is it has a vein on the back that points the tube into the direction where the wind is coming from. And you might see there's a small hole right here on the front. Let me zoom in so you guys can see. So that hole is where the wind is hitting. So it will blow on that hole and actually create a difference in pressure between the inside of the tube and the outside of the tube. That difference in pressure is the force of the wind on the instrument, and we can use that force to calculate a wind speed. And to my knowledge, we're the only observatory that makes use of this technology. It's a really unique way to measure wind speeds in this really crazy mountaintop weather station. Now, what happens then is that is actually measured by this instrument here, and there are tubes that run down all the way through the tower back into the weather room to record on this chart here. So this is called our haste chart. It is a paper chart that rotates around over a period of 24 hours, and there is a red pen that records ink on the side of that chart. 
and I actually show you guys the active haze chart right now. So let me move out of the way so you can see. So this is our haze chart recording the wind speeds up here right now. So again, that red line is recorded in relation to the force of the wind. The further away from the center that line records, the faster the wind speeds are. And you'll, if you look really closely, you can see the pen wiggling back and forth there. That back and forth wiggle is the force of the gust. So the bigger the back and forth wiggle, the stronger the gust is. And so this is the one that's actively recording right now. Pretty cool for us to be able to see that. But this is an example chart from the President's Day storm of 2015, where we saw winds upwards of 141 miles per hour, 122 knots. And look how far away from the center that was being recorded. Really, really impressive wind events. And so these paper charts we have going back all the way to 1940, uh, so you could see all the different impressive wind events that we've seen over our time. So yeah, that's how we measure wind. That's how we do it at different surface base stations and up here. That's what wind is. And so if you guys have any questions, feel free to post them into the chat here. A couple of things I want to point out before we get into uh, talking about your guys' questions here. Uh, if you guys are looking for more information, you can head to Home of the World's Worst Weather Live. Uh, so you can go back and find lots of really great information. So here's the worksheet if you didn't have it pulled up. Um, so you can click on it there. Uh, for reference, it looks like this. So you can go back and answer plenty of questions about our talk today uh, and find out some really interesting information about wind and how it's measured. There's also a link for you to build your own wind vane at home. So you can actually build one using things like straws and paper plates and cups. So you too at home can measure wind speed uh, even in your backyard, which is really, really cool. So make sure you check that out. And then lastly, if you go to mountwashington.org to the observer comments, we actually posted a blog about Big Wind Day, about what it was like all those years ago, 86 years ago, when they measured the 231 mile per hour wind. So you can see the surface chart from that. You can see the personal perspective of the observers who were here on the summit and how they didn't believe anyone was gonna believe them all the incredible icing that they saw, lots of really great information. So you guys can make sure to check out the observer comment page and you can read lots of really great information about that. So again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to post them in chat. I'm gonna go ahead and scroll back here and see what I can find. So if you'll bear with me for a moment. All right, Helen would like to know how long has the storm lasted here? So the storm, as far as this current low pressure, started this morning, right around the time, maybe an hour before I woke up, so around 5 a.m. Um, and it's been going on ever since then. So we've been seeing rain. Our wind speeds have been ramping up. Again, we're kind of dancing in the 50 to 70 with gusts to 90 miles per hour at this point. Um, so yeah, we've seen some pretty impressive winds and it's likely to last through the rest of the day today and into tonight. Let's see. How much snow do we have up there for the year? I actually don't know the question to that off the top of my head. I know from this past weekend, we saw upwards of 21 inches per snow. That's actually starting to melt with the rain that we've been seeing. So if you head to our norms, means, and extremes, you can go back and look at each month's snowfall total um, to see how much we've seen so far this year. But I imagine with all the rain, it's very rapidly melting, even as we speak. So... Reed and Olivia would like to know, do you think the warm temperatures will melt any of the ice there? Yes, I do, and yes, I hope so, uh, because we still have the ice from Tom Shift on the side of the tower, like big, like human-sized chunks of ice on the side of the tower, and I'm a little worried uh, that as they start to melt, eventually they're going to fall, and hopefully the A-frame will break them up and dissipate them across the deck, but um, yes, I really do hope the ice melts, because it'd be really nice to have our tower back to normal so we can have the observation deck cam back, so that'd be really nice. Uh, how much rain are we getting today? We're expecting an inch or two on the summit, which is pretty impressive in one 24-hour period. So we're expecting yeah, upwards of two inches of rain by the time this system is done. Uh, let's see. Tab would like to know, why is April such a rainy month? Um, and the answer to that really comes in, it's regionally based, so different parts of the world are going to see different amounts of rain at this time of year. But we are at the transitional point where it's no longer cold enough uh, for snow to form. So if you're like me, I love snow, um, and I really don't like the rain terribly much, but it has its purposes. And we're just getting to that point of the year where things are finally warm enough where instead of seeing snow, we're seeing rain. Uh, we're also seeing the formation of lots of low pressure systems, which is a talk that we'll get into another deep dive at some other time. Uh, but this is just a time of year where we see lots of storm development, lots of precipitation, and lots of moisture moving across the country. So it's just part of the season. Uh, let's see, Cole, would like to know, has anyone been blown away by the wind? Were they injured? To my knowledge, nobody's been blown away off the top of the mountain at this point. We all kind of have our cutoff points for what we'll go outside in. Mine is around 140 miles per hour. That might be tested today. We'll see. Um, but we are very safe and we do take every precaution necessary to make sure that we're staying safe in these crazy conditions and not putting ourselves in harm's way. So nobody's been ever blown off the summit. I know a couple observers have been knocked out by flying ice chunks, but I'm pretty sure as bad as that is, that's the worst of it. 
um, and everybody's been okay so far. All right, let's take a couple other questions here. Um, <laughs> so Katie would like to know if we can explain why low pressure systems bring in extreme weather. And I believe we will do a deep dive session coming up here very soon about pressure and pressure systems. But what I can tell you is that low pressure is a vacuum that as air moves away from the surface. Air moving up through the atmosphere is a disturbance that spreads energy out through the atmosphere. That energy creates instability. And the more energy and the more unstable a low pressure system becomes, it's kind of like a feedback loop. The more moisture that gets lifted, the more energy that gets dispersed, the stronger the system becomes. And so it really just is a factor of a number of things. Again, we'll talk about it in that deep dive coming up, but low pressures are disturbances that are basically dispersing energy through the atmosphere to try to return it to that state of balance. All right, we'll take two more questions here and then we're about out of time. Bella would like to know, Ian, have you ever gotten frostbite from extreme winds and cold? And the answer is yes. Uh, the reason why is kind of silly though. Uh, so it was two winters ago, we were outside and it was 31 degrees below. Uh, and we were outside doing weather experiments. Uh, we were doing some pretty cold related experiments. What we did is we took a banana and threw it out into a snow drift and let it freeze for about 45 minutes. Uh, and then we went outside and I took my glove off and held the banana and tried to like break it and open it. It was so frozen solid that we actually used it to drive a nail into a two by four. So we called it the banana hammer experiment. But I had my gloves off for maybe, maybe a minute. Uh, and I did get a little bit of frostbite. My hand was all red and stingy. Um, so I had to come in and warm it up for sure. So um, that was my bad for not keeping my glove on and something I shouldn't have done. But it doesn't take terribly long for us to get the uh, effects of uh, hypothermia and frostbite when we see those really crazy cold conditions. All right, one more. Um, let's see. And would like to know how many people are working up here currently. So right now there's myself and I'm running the day shift. And then we've got Jay and David who are operating the night shift. So on our side, there are only three people. Now on the New Hampshire State Park side, there is one person, Danny, who is up here running like the entire rest of the building and the summit. And they do a fantastic job being the stewards up here, making sure everything functions and everything is working, fixing any problems that come up. But in grand total, there are four of us here on the summit right now. Um, and so, yeah, we're doing our best to work through this pandemic and do everything that we can to stay safe, uh, practice social distancing and things like that. But there really aren't that many of us up here. All right, so we are out of time. I've gone well past my time at this point. If you guys have any other questions, feel free to post them in the chat. You could always reach out through direct message on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and I will try to get to your questions as fast as I can today. We really appreciate you guys tuning in. Make sure, you, again, you go to mountwashington.org forward slash classroom so you can get all the good information like the worksheet and the experiment. Uh, make sure you check out the blog so you can get lots of really great information from there. And then tune in tomorrow at 11.15. We'll be doing a forecast and we'll talk about the current summit conditions and what we're going to expect for the next 48 hours. And I'll even recap the crazy weather that we're likely to see today. So again, thank you so much for attending. Hopefully we'll see you guys tomorrow. Hopefully you enjoyed the talk and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.